Good afternoon. I am Uday Shetty, and you're watching another session of Pharma Best Practices webinars. The topic for today's webinar is regulatory requirements and expectation for cleaning and disinfection of controlled manufacturing areas. Today's session is the 77th session since we started this webinar series in March 2020. Information about all these webinars is available on our website, pbpw.in, Pharma Best Practices Webinars, pbpw.in. Gentlemen, please welcome Matt. Over to you, Matt, for your presentation. Thanks very much, Uday. Um, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Uday, can you just check that you can see my screen okay? Yes, I can see your screen okay. Perfect, good. So, um, as Uday mentioned, we're going to talk today about the regulatory requirements and expectations for cleaning and disinfection, disinfection of controlled manufacturing areas. So, a topic I think certainly for myself and in my day-to-day -day job is, is um, uh, very much uh, uh, something that's close to my heart, I guess, um, and something really that's of vital importance as part of your contamination control strategy. So what we're going to cover today really is we're going to talk about the regulatory requirements and then also the expectations around cleaning and disinfection activities. So as many of you know, as far as the regulatory requirements go, um, we have um, certain um, regulatory documents that we need to be aware of and we need to make sure that we're in compliance with. So, for example, in North America, we have the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA Code of Federal Regulations, the CFRs. Within Europe, we have uh, EU GMP or UDRELEX, as it's known, UDRELEX Volume 4. We then have the PICS GMP guidance. So, for those um, uh, countries uh, that are signed up as part of uh, the PICS group, um, that kind of aligns those two regulatory sets of documents, UDRELEX and, and PICS. In the UK, for example, we have the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Authority, the HPRA in Ireland, the TGA in Australia, and of course, we have the CDSCO in India as well. Um, and again, we need to sort of bear in mind with, with India, um, you know, that it's, it's one of the sort of um, large emerging markets and certainly, you know, one of the largest vaccine producers in the world. So um, really, we're looking to make sure that we're in line with these regulatory requirements. But as well as those requirements, um, there are certain regulatory expectations um, with regards to cleaning and disinfection. And there's good guidance documents, really, that we should be aware of. So, for example, you can see on screen here, we've talked about the FDA guidance for industry, that's sterile drug products produced by aseptic processing, um, current good manufacturing process. There's also the PICS um, guidance on the validation of aseptic processes. There's uh, within the United States Pharmacopeia, within the USP, there's chapter 1072 on antiseptics and disinfectants, which is a really good chapter actually to, to have a look at and to reference and to be aware of what's in that chapter. And I will refer to it um, throughout this SOP actually. Um, so there's some good guidance in there. And then we also have, for example, some other technical documents such as the Parental Drug Association, the PDA, Technical Report 70, which is on the fundamentals of cleaning and disinfection programs for aseptic manufacturing facilities. And really, of course, we need to be very much aware of the regulatory documents and actually what we are required to do. But it's good to take this, um, and I, I'm not a fan of the word, but this, this holistic approach and think of all this guidance and all this documentation in the round because I think that really um, starts to get you towards where the direction of travel is in, in, in the industry um, with regards to making sure we're doing the right thing and ultimately producing safe and effective medicines for patients. So as you can see, there are multiple regulators and influencers around the world. Um, so as we mentioned, a few of those, the FDA, the European Medicine Agency, the PDA, the TGA for the Australian government, okay, um, and the CDSCO for, for India. So we have all of these multiple regulators and influencers that we're really trying to um, be aware of um, and be aware of what the requirements are. And certainly, 
because we see now, particularly through the activity of the um, Pharmaceutical Inspectorate Cooperation Scheme, PICS, we're seeing that many of these regulators certainly um, are actually starting to harmonize. So the requirements with regards GMP more generally, and then of course, cleaning and disinfection activities, which are related to your contamination control strategy, are becoming more and more harmonized as we go along. So when it comes to cleaning and disinfection processes, um, we need to really realize that these processes are critical to contamination control. But unfortunately, and I find this in my day-to-day -day, um, job, um, they are often undervalued and they can be performed at the end of the day, um, or sometimes they can be actually um, given out to contract staff with little or no control um, maintained over that process. Broadly speaking, cleaning and disinfection is not a popular activity, okay? So it's sometimes physically difficult, physically hard. It seems like it is, is non-specialist work, but actually it is ultimately very, very critical to um, the maintenance of contamination control within your clean room. Sometimes we also find that actually cleaning and disinfection processes are historic and they have little or no justification. So you may find that you've joined a company and you have almost inherited some of these practices, okay? And, and you don't know why um, tasks are being performed in the way that they are. So again, really not given um, the level of scrutiny they should be. And we also find that they're often not subject to this comprehensive and objective review. So people really are not, um, again, taking sometimes taking a step back and seeing that if there is an issue or a problem within their clean rooms, then um, they need to really um, look at that problem with the cleaning and disinfection strategy in mind. So uh, can that be a way of, of rectifying that issue? Or perhaps is there something that has changed in the facility or something we need to do about you know, changing frequencies or types of disinfection agents um, that we're actually using. But unfortunately, despite the fact that um, you know, these processes are not um, often subject to review and are, are undervalued, we do see that they are frequently a source of regulatory observation. So as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, um, the FDA published the, um, the 483s, the observation, the, um, uh, the inspection observations on their website. So that is, is open data. Um, and we've taken here 2019 as, a, as an example year um, where we've actually seen some of the observations that are in some way related to cleaning and disinfection. And I won't go through the list, but you can see that actually around 490 of the 779 observations that year related in some way to cleaning and disinfection. Now, I will say it is difficult sometimes to drill down completely and say these are absolutely um, to do with, you know, uh, those activities. But certainly, you know, they're in they're in those particular categories. So, for example, we saw the fifth most common observation was around cleaning, sanitization, and maintenance. Okay, so certainly cleaning could have been, you know, one of the elements within there that was causing that high number, 99 observations um, that occurred uh, in that year. We then also see, for example, and you can see I've just added in bold some of the particular areas that I wanted to highlight here. We see things like deficiencies in the procedures for cleaning and maintenance. We see cleaning and sanitization records not kept. We see deficiencies related to SOPs for the use of cleaning and sanitizing agents, or even the use of, and this is in North America particularly, use of non-FDA registered products. So you can see that the regulators are looking at cleaning and disinfection activities, and they are recognizing it as um, a really, really critical part of what you do um, every day. Part of my role as, as a global technical consultant for Ecolab is actually to go into people's facilities um, and we perform essentially narrow scope audits, I guess you would term them, where we are looking at people's cleaning and disinfection activities and actually um, seeing how they, they stack up against the regulations and the guidance. And actually I would, I would sort of 
mirror what I'm seeing here in terms of the uh, the FDA inspection findings here. So very often I'm seeing that people are not keeping adequate records, they're not ensuring they have control over these processes, they're not making sure that we have reproducibility in the activities that we're performing. So in case some of you were uh, planning on having a little sleep uh, during the presentation, um, we have got some poll questions actually that we will be asking you um, as we go through um, the uh, seminar today. So our first poll is um, to ask the people that are on the call today, um, in light of what we've just talked about, has your site checked in the last 12 months that the cleaning and disinfection practices in use still meet regulatory guidance? Okay, so the question we're asking there is, has your site checked in the last 12 months um, that actually you're still, your disinfectant practices are still in line with the regulatory guidance? So fantastic, I can see um, lots and lots of people um, that are actually polling in, so thank you very much for taking part. Um, it does make it um, much, much easier <laughs> for me when I can uh, get some responses back. So good, uh, I can see it slowing down a little bit, okay. So just to reiterate, the, the question is there, um, whether your site has checked in the last 12 months uh, that the cleaning and disinfection practices in use still meet regulatory requirements. Good, so I think we're pretty much all done. So I'll just close the poll there um, and let's just share you the poll results. So um, as you can see, we had 71% of you were saying that yes, you um, you. Uh, you did actually, or you have actually checked in the last 12 months and your cleaning and disinfection practices do still meet regulatory uh, requirements. We have 12% of you saying, no, you haven't done it in the last 12 months. So again, hopefully after today's presentation, um, you know, it's something you might want to consider, which is the frequency at which you review your procedures. And again, I think what's quite interesting um, is we have 16% of the people that are on the call that are actually unsure. So that could be, um, that you are not involved in those processes or actually it means that you need to go away after today um, and ask those questions uh, on site. Good, so thank you very much again for all the people that took part um, in that. I think that's uh, um, really, really interesting to see the, the responses that we got in from people today. So, what we're going to think about with the regulatory insights is the sort of aspects you should be consider, considering. So um, we're going to go through and we're going to look at the, the regulatory expectations and the guidance around these different areas. And hopefully we're going to talk about really um, on a very top level what good looks like for you. So we're going to talk about personnel and training, documentation and records related to cleaning and disinfection. We'll talk briefly about cleaning equipment talk about preparation and use of disinfectants, rotation. Um, we'll talk about the differences between cleaning and disinfection, and certainly that's something that um, has had more focus um, recently um, through the changes to um, Udralex Annex 1. And again, that you will see that sort of ripple out then to PICS because of the PICS guidance being aligned with Udralex. Um, and then we'll see, you know, obviously other countries really trying to make sure they're sort of in line with, the, with these fairly harmonized guidance. We'll talk about disinfection validation. Um, we'll talk about environmental monitoring as well. And then at the end, we'll touch on sort of transfer disinfection and really what, what the sort of um, latest thinking is uh, around that. So when it, comes to, um, when it comes to personnel training, there are certain requirements and expectations. So you can see here on the PICS guide to GMP, it's saying that the manufacturer should provide training for the personnel who go into production areas. Um, and that's including the technical, maintenance, and cleaning personnel. So it's really important that we have adequate training for those people. And again, you'll see the theme developing really through here. The FDA aseptic processing guide is saying appropriate chaining should be conducted. And it even gives you some topics here. So it's saying the topics should include aseptic technique, clean room behavior, microbiology so for all of the microbiologists on the call you have a real um, position within your company um, and a real part to play in making sure that people have adequate levels of microbiology knowledge to allow them to safely go into clean rooms and again FDA goes on to say hygiene gown in patient safety hazards that are posed by non-sterile drug products all of these should be part of the training package 
I mentioned already that Annex uh, Annex One is changing in Udrelex. So there's a the current draft at the moment. It's it's actually being revised and is expected to to um, go live this year. But um, the current draft, which is version 12 that was published in February 2020, is again saying that all personnel including those performing cleaning, maintenance, monitoring, and anyone that access clean rooms should be trained. And that should include microbiology, hygiene, and have focuses on things like clean room practices. So again, I think it's really, really clear here that we need to make sure that people entering our clean rooms are adequately, adequately trained. And again, what we're looking to do, and particularly with this element of the training in microbiology, is to make sure that actually people not only know how to do a task, but also why they're doing the task in that specific way. Okay, so when people have an understanding of microbiology, an understanding of aseptic technique, they understand why you might be able to, you might be getting them to do things in what initially may seem like a, a strange way, but it's to do with, you know, minimizing contamination control um, and making sure we all work in it in a very methodical manner. So again, in USP 1072, and I, I did mention that, you know, I will talk about that chapter a number of times in the presentation today. Again, that's really just reinforcing staff involved in disinfection need training in all of those different aspects, including safe handling of disinfectants, preparation, disposal, and appropriate application methods as well. And again, PICS coming up very much with the same sort of list around the type of training that really we need to be thinking about doing with our operators, our maintenance personnel, our cleaning personnel, and really anybody that's entering your clean room area. So that training really, and this is what sort of best practice is, this is what good looks like, this training should be assessed and documented as you would elsewhere. The training should include not only the cleaning and disinfection procedures, but as we've seen in those regulatory guidance, also the basics of GMP and the microbiology and the hygiene elements. Um, the training should include a practical component. So actually performing the technique or even visualizing the risks. And by that, we mean um, in a training situation, um, you know, not within the clean room, but in a training situation, you might want to think about novel methods of training. So things like using ultraviolet dyes or powders or ways of visualizing contamination moving around. Sometimes for non-microbiologists, it's difficult to kind of um, get that understanding of, of how contamination may move. So think about sort of um, novel ways of trying to, to make that a very visual process to see those risks. And please try and avoid what happened to me in my first ever pharmaceutical job where they sat me down and gave me whatever it was, 20, 30 pages, 30 SOPs, sorry, to read, each one probably of, of 20 or 30 pages. Um, and they gave me those to just sit down and try and digest. That's not really training, okay? So try and make sure that, you know, you, you have this practical aspect. And actually, um, training of cleaners or contract cleaners specifically is often overlooked and not given the same attention as the training of your company staff. Okay. And this is really, really important. There is nothing inherently wrong with using contract cleaners, but you need to make sure you maintain the control over them. Okay. Um, again, I've certainly been on site. I asked the question once of um, uh, one of the production managers on site. Um, okay, so who is training um, your um, contract cleaners? And they said, uh, oh, we don't know. We think the supervisors of the contract company are training them. We, of course, then asked how often they're training the supervisors and they didn't know. And actually, when we drilled down a bit further, I asked them, well, what cleaning and disinfection agents um, are the contract cleaners using? And they couldn't tell me the answer. What they'd actually done was allowed the contract company to have complete control over the agents that were being used and the application methods that were being used. So. Nothing wrong with using contract staff, but you do need to maintain the control over that activity. And actually, we've we've heard people say that, actually, as you can see from the quote on the bottom, a microbiologist's best clean room control for contamination is the cleaning and disinfection team. So that was a, a direct quote, actually, from one of our customers. So it's really, really important. And certainly when I was in industry, you know, I knew the head of the uh, cleaning department. I knew all of the cleaners individually, knew their names, knew the names of their wives, girlfriends, significant others, dogs and cats. 
you know, I, I had a good relationship with them because actually as the microbiologist with responsibility for contamination control on site, it was really important that I had trust uh, in that team to be performing those activities correctly. So we come to the next poll for the, for the day. So um, again, uh, we're gonna make sure that we, we sort of ask the people that are on the call today, does your site use contract staff for cleaning and disinfection activities? So I think this will be quite interesting uh, for people on the call. Does your site use cleaning, uh, use contract staff, sorry, for its cleaning and disinfection activities? So I've opened the poll. Um, so all of you that want to vote, and I can see people are straight in with the voting. So again, thank you very much for doing that. We want to know of the people on the call tonight, does your site use contract staff for cleaning and disinfection activities? So we can see everybody voting at the minute. So I think we've got about 99, I think we're yes, getting there with about 100% of the people um, actually polling. So good stuff. Thank you very much. I will close the poll uh, and share the results. So you can see of the people on the call today, we had 58% of the people on the call are actually using um, contract staff uh, for those cleaning and disinfection activities. 41% of you are saying no, so I'm assuming there you're using your own production operators, your own staff for those activities. And then we had about 2% of the same saying um, they were unsure. So certainly I would say for the 58% of you on the call, it's really important that you actually, <clears throat> um, after this call, go and check around the controls that are over those contract staff. So um, do you have responsibility for the training? Do you know um, how they're applying disinfectants, how they're removing disinfectants, and even the, the disinfectants that are in use? I think it's really, really important. Good, so again, thank you very much for uh, taking part in that poll. I think it's really interesting for people on the call to see you know, what other sites are doing. So we move on to documentation and records. And again, we'll go through a few of the sort of requirements and expectation. And I think actually, this is a really, really key, um, key sort of piece of guidance here in the FDA guidance for aseptic processing. It's saying that disinfection procedures should be described in sufficient detail. So the preparation, the work sequence, the contact time should be described in enough detail to enable reproducibility. And that's the key thing. It's very often when we are validating disinfectants, and we'll come on to that later, when we're validating them, we validate a contact time. And then we need to make sure that actually the documentations and records and procedures are ensuring that that contact time is used in practice in the facility um, every time. So the best practice really around documentation and records is that um, they give all the necessary details. So you need to have the responsibilities for the activity. So who's responsible for that cleaning and disinfection? And we see regulatory observations around this when it's not clear who's responsible for that activity. We need a schedule of cleaning disinfection. We need a description of the materials that are approved for use. So making sure that we only use approved materials. We need details of the techniques to be used. And again, those details, you know, they need to be, um, there needs to be enough detail there to make sure they can be reproduced. So that can be um, how many sprays you use on a wipe, how you fold wipes, okay, when you are changing mop heads. So we need to have that kind of level of detail in there. We need instructions for cleaning and storage of the equipment. And we need also instructions for the preparation and the disposal of disinfectant solutions. But also, having said we need that sufficient detail, please do consider how the document will work in practice. So those instructions need to be clear and concise. And please use tables and diagrams and photographs wherever possible, rather than just lots and lots of text that is difficult to, to read every day. And sometimes you might find it's useful to separate out a sort of overarching cleaning and disinfection policy document. So that's what materials are improved for use and how they should be used. And separate that out from the cleaning and disinfection schedule. So the document that the um, staff performing that activity are going to be referring to every day, that document just needs to tell them what to use, when to use it. Okay. So um, make sure there is, you know, it might be useful to split those documents out and have, you know, the, the higher level of detail that they can refer to in a, in a different overarching policy. <clears throat> and make sure, obviously, you're recording 
um, the details of the task that you perform. So really, we need to see the name or the signature and the initials of the person that's performing the task. We need to have you know, documented records of the preparation of disinfectants and cleaning agents. And again, really importantly, and this is something I see being missed quite a lot actually within um, the, the pharmaceutical environment, is the batch number and the expiry date of the cleaning agent or the disinfectant being used. So again, you know, we do hope it won't happen, but it's not unheard of for manufacturers of clean room disinfectants to have an issue or, for example, have to have a recall of their products, in which case, you know, you, know, you would then need to try and see which batches um, were being manufactured in your facility at the time when this disinfectant was in use, okay, in order to make an assessment about any impact that has had. Okay. And very often I've heard people say, well, um, we knew it was this batch, but it was in use for a month. Well, that simply means if there was a major problem with a disinfectant, um, you know, you would have a month's worth of manufacture where you, you perhaps wouldn't be, be sure um, which product was being used. So it's really good practice to record the batch numbers in use and the expiry dates. And make sure those records are reviewed frequently by a supervisor to ensure compliance. Um, I had this in my time where um, I had contamination events. Um, I would ask by telephone, you know, is there is there anything that happened in the manufacturing area I should be aware of? Was everything done according to the SOP? And I would be told yes. Um, and then as I got further into the investigation, normally that's when I would gown, go into the clean room, and then I would start to look at those cleaning and disinfection logbooks and I was finding that there were um, areas where cleaning and disinfection had been missed and no one had been notified and actually no one was signing those records off. So it could be, you know, up to a month before we, we found out that some of that cleaning and disinfection had been missed. So it's really about the sort of due diligence around those activities. And again, we need to be very careful about the sort of equipment we use as well. So again, we can see here in the PICS Guide to GMP for Medicinal Products in 2018, it's it's saying some fairly obvious things, but you know, something we need to be aware of, which is the washing and cleaning equipment itself should be chosen and used in order not to be a source of contamination. So again, that's classically, it could be using equipment that's not designed for clean rooms, or it could be the mop and bucket that is left you know, with a, a, a dirty, you know, few centimetres of water in the bottom of the bucket with the mop still in it and left in the corner of the room for a day. That's a, a contamination source, okay? That could be a source of contamination itself. And we need to be aware of that and make sure that we, um, we negate that. And again, you'll see that, you know, it's telling you the design of your cleaning processes for your premises equipment um, you know, uh, should be such that the cleaning process themselves don't present a cross-contamination risk. So this, for example, may be um, thinking about uh, changing the equipment or the mop heads as you move from room to room where different products are being made or potentially where it's important that you minimize cross-contamination, um, always making sure that you are mopping from the furthest point within your facility, mopping towards the door. So you're always pulling contamination out of the area out towards the, the airlocks or the personnel um, areas, moving it out towards the lower grade uh, within your facility. Just a comment here about, um, you know, uh, uh, the equipment again from the ISO 14644 standards where it tells you that standard commercial or industrial grade mops and handles shouldn't be used in clean room environments. Okay? Um, you know, and that can also include your changing areas and other controlled areas. So really it's about using the right sort of standard of materials um, within your facility. And again, I think it's really interesting here um, around uh, floor scrubbers. So in 14644, it's telling you that standard commercial floor scrubbers or buffers should never be used within an operating clean room because the process will contaminate the environment. Okay, so they will throw out an awful lot of particles, probably throw out an awful lot of contamination. Um, you know, the potential there for cross-contamination risk is very, very high. They do go on to say that special machines designed for scrubbing clean room floors are available. Okay, so it's making sure, again, we have the right level of equipment. But again, those shouldn't be used when the clean room, when it's in operation either. 
And another question here is about um, waxes and, and non-permanent sealers on floors. So this is something I've come across, which is people that have clean room floors, they will put a wax or a sealer on that floor to make it nice and smooth and give it a lovely mirror finish on the floor. Um, and then when I ask people about that, um, they say, yeah, 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 we, we, we replace that sealer or that wax um, on an annual basis. Somebody comes in every year and uh, they will reseal the floor for us. And I think what we need to be asking is, well, that's fine, but where did all of the sealer that was on the floor go? And where it went, of course, was into your clean room environment somewhere. Okay, so really it's saying within this guidance that waxes are the non-permanent sealers will flake off and cause contamination with traffic. Uh, and therefore any equipment used to apply or buff such finishes are also never recommended. So we also need to think about our cleaning equipment. So, um, you know, when it comes to our, our mop heads and our wipes that we're using within clean rooms, there are different uh, types of materials manufacture for those items so we can have things like blended polyester cellulose materials we can have 100% um, polyester materials and again the, the way they're manufactured can differ greatly so for example we have polyester cellulose very often they are non-woven sometimes even they are, are hydro entangled so they are wetted and the fibers are, are forced together under pressure in, in liquid to, to hydro entangle um, whereas um, in the higher grade areas, we need to be thinking about looking at um, knitted materials. So that's got a much tighter weave, a much more stable weave on it. Um, they tend to be um, uh, less particles given off from those materials. And very often those will have sonic sealed or laser sealed edges as well to reduce the particles given off. So do remember that particle or lint-free wipes and mops don't really exist. And the, and the amount of fibers or particles that are shed does depend on the material of construction and also the method of manufacture as well. Like I said, whether it's non-woven or whether it's knitted material. Do make sure the material you select for your cleaning equipment is compatible with the products in use. So wipes and mops, um, you know, manufactured using chemical binders, and that does happen on occasion, are not really suitable for clean rooms in most instances, because actually when you put a disinfectant or an alcohol onto those, those types of materials, the binders can then come out of the, the material itself onto your clean room surfaces. Um, but again, there can be other considerations. So for example, if you use microfiber materials um, and you use those with um, things like quaternary ammonium compounds, okay, which are very common clean room disinfectants, those quats or quacks as they're known um, are positively charged. And so if you're using something like an anionic detergent in order to try and launder those, they may not be effective in, in pulling that charged particle out of the microfiber. So again, it's really, um, uh, you know, having an interest really and, and, you know, and being curious about the processes, diving a bit deeper into the processes when you're selecting your, your equipment. So select the right grade of white for the task at hand um, in terms of the composition, the sterility, and sometimes you'll find that sterile disposable materials are best practice because when you start to launder materials there again that's more questions then around um, how you launder those materials how often you launder them how you control um, replacing um, either damaged materials or replacing them at a set frequency okay so you need more control around it so even though they are sometimes more expensive single-use disposable materials are often best practice in clean rooms So then we start to think about the preparation and use of our disinfectants. Okay, so again, we can see here, if we look at some of the regulatory guidance in the PICS, um, Guidance to Aseptic Processes in 2011, it's saying um, that there should be documented procedures around preparation and storage of disinfectants. And actually, if you're using things like spray bottles and trigger sprays, they should be sterile before being filled for your grade A, A B areas and should have a short in-use shelf life because it's accepted that if you have a standard non-protected trigger, those can get very rapidly contaminated in use. So you need to have a short in-use shelf life on those. Again, USP chapter 1072, um, you know, really useful chapter, um, is telling you that actually um, diluted disinfectants must have an assigned expiration date justified by effectiveness studies. Okay, so you need to really have the data when you're storing these, these products 
um, that justifies those storage per periods that you're allowing. And again, we see the change to Annex 1, so the, the version 12 draft um, that I've, I talked about before, um, it's telling you here that the, the processes need to be validated, um, and that validation is, is to support you know, the effectiveness, but also should support the in-use expiry periods of prepared solutions. So we need to think about how long we're holding these solutions. Um, is that safe? Do they remain effective? And again, uh, in, in uh, Annex 1, it's telling you that where the disinfectants and detergents are made up by the sterile product manufacturer, and by that they mean the end user yourselves. Okay, So where they're, they're being made by the sterile product manufacturer, they should be monitored for microbial contamination. So in your grade A, B areas, you need to monitor them for microbial contamination. And again, potentially in your lower grade areas, if that's considered a risk, you, know, you need to make sure that you're not allowing your disinfectants or your cleaning agents to be held for periods where they can become contaminated or even grossly contaminated. Something that's just been added to, to um, the annex, which I think is very interested, which is it's saying that if the disinfectants and detergents are supplied ready-made, so sometimes we call them ready-to-use solutions, uh, so from disinfectant manufacturers um, selling clean room disinfectants, then results from certificates of analysis or certificates of conformance can be accepted subject to successful completion of the appropriate vendor qualification. So again, it's making sure that your disinfectant um, and cleaning agent suppliers um, are part of your, um, your audit regime. You, you make sure you categorize them as a, as a, you know, a, a critical or a medium or a, a low risk supplier. Um, you, know, you make sure you categorize them, you make sure you have them um, within your audit schedule um, and you have or you have um, appropriate vendor qualification to make sure that they are providing you with good quality products so you can trust those certificates if that's the case then that means you may not have to actually do some um, uh, do any work on holding disinfectants you have the confidence there there from the certificates of analysis or certificates of conformance uh, from the supplier so we'll have another poll then. Um, so we'll just ask the people that are on the call today, has your site validated either open expiry periods for concentrates and in use shelf lives or hold times for diluted disinfectants? So the poll is, has your site validated um, open expiry periods for your concentrates and in use shelf life or, or sometimes called a hold time for your diluted disinfectants? So um, we want to kind of find out um, the, the activities of people on the sites um, who are on the call today. So I'll launch the poll. And hopefully we'll see people starting to vote. Great stuff. Okay, good. So the question we're asking at the moment there is, has your site validated the open expiry periods for your concentrates and the in-use shelf life, sometimes known as the hold time, for your diluted disinfectants? Okay. So you, do you have information on that? Good. So we're still collecting some responses. I think that looks pretty much like everybody has voted. So again, thank you very much for everyone for taking part in the poll. Um, I always think it's really interesting. So let's have a look at those poll results then. So we can see that of the people on the call today, um, we have 69% of the people on the call saying, yes, they have validated the open expiry periods for the concentrates and the in-use shelf lives or hold times for the diluted disinfectants. 20% of you are saying no on the call, and we have 11% of you that are unsure. So again, I would suggest for the people that have said no or are unsure, it's something perhaps after today's um, webinar um, you take a look at to make sure you sort of um, you're in compliance on your site. Good. So. We need to think about preparation and use of disinfectants, okay, and the best practice really then um, coming on from what we've just talked about. So we need to make sure that the efficacy is effective throughout the period of use of your disinfectant and the formulation is stable. And that's very much reliant on the controlled storage conditions and the operator preparation on your sites. Okay, so validation of all your different variables and processes need to be considered. You're going to need to think about validation or integrity testing of your filters, and there are time and cost implications to all of that activity. Okay, so when we're looking at concentrates, you know, there's a few 
key points really which is concentrate should be measured accurately according to the manufacturer's instructions and i've put here consider the concentration exponent so within usp chapter 1072 it talks about this in more detail which can be quite useful which is some disinfectants are more susceptible than others to over or under dilution so it's really important that we measure accurately just a quick comment i've been on site before now and I've seen people trying to measure out 59.8 millilitres of concentrate in a two litre plastic volumetric, okay, which is clearly, you know, an inappropriate size of volumetric to measure out your concentrates. If you're trying to measure out 58.2 millilitres, then you're probably going to want something like a 100 mil volumetric. So again, just make sure you have the ability to measure those concentrates accuracy, accurately. The quality of water used will impact on the efficacy. So make sure you validate and use the type of water um, you know uh, you have within your facility. So if you're doing validation, you make sure you you use um, the same grade of water that you're going to be using in practice. And and again, please do make sure you have control over this. I've had in the last probably 12 to 18 months two occasions where I've gone on site. Um, and we've been observing cleaning and disinfecting activity and we've watched uh, and actually in both instances it was contract staff we've watched contract staff measure out the concentrates then disappear into a a cleaner's cupboard or store or sluice if you like and use um, hot tap water to dilute disinfectants when actually the sops and the facility thought that the disinfectants were being diluted using purified water okay so there was a, um, a not enough control over that activity do remember that the solutions in grade a and b need to be sterile filtered or ready to use formats um, and as we've mentioned if uh, prepared dilutions are stored we need studies to show that the that there is stability of that formulation um, and sterility where that's applicable during storage so you're going to need to do a little bit of a validation study there and as I've already mentioned, please, please, please do make sure the preparation of those concentrates is documented. That's really important. So then we come on to disinfection rotation. And again, I think hopefully by now it's relatively clear, but we can see here the FDA guidance is telling you a sound disinfectant program also includes a sporicidal agent used to a written schedule and where the data suggests presence of spore forming organisms. USP 1072, it is prudent to augment the daily use of a bactericidal agent with weekly or monthly use of a sporicidal agent. That's really the only place where you'll see a frequency being given. But again, I would just be mindful that that is um, what I would describe as a throwaway comment, weekly or monthly. It's just trying to give you an indication um, you know, of, of the type of um, um, rotation frequencies you may see. And again, in USP 1072, it is actually giving you some further guidance here to say that the daily application of sporicidal agents is not generally favoured because of the tendency for them to corrode equipment and because of the potential for chronic operator exposure. When we look at Annex 1 now, um, we can see that that's quite clear. That it's telling you that more than one type of disinfectant agent should be employed and they should have different modes of action. Their combined usage should be effective against all bacteria and fungi and should include the periodic use of a sporicidal agent. So I think when we look at all the documentation, it's really, really clear, okay, that actually the expectation is that you are rotating different disinfection, disinfectants. So um, I've put a question here to the people that are on the call today. Why do you think we rotate disinfectants with a different mode of action? So this is, I guess, in some respects, quite an old question, but, um, why do you think um, that we're rotating uh, disinfectants with a different mode of action? So uh, hopefully if I can get this to work, for some reason my poll is, oops. There we go. So we just launched the poll. So for the people on the call today, why do you think we're rotating disinfectants with a different mode of action? Okay. So let's have a look at, the answers coming in. Good, okay. For me, as a microbiologist, I think it's very interesting to see uh, see the answers we're getting in the poll here. So, 
good. So I think mainly most people have answered, so I will just close the poll now. The, the question was, of course, why do you think we rotate uh, disinfectants with different modes of action? And we'll share the results with everybody. So we have 2% of the people say, well, it's so you have a backup in case one runs out. Okay. We have 74% of the people on the call saying it's to prevent microbial resistance. And we have 25% of the people on the call saying that it's to have the full spectrum of activity. Really, really interesting for me. So um, it may surprise the 74% of you that voted that actually microbial resistance is now fairly discredited in terms of use of disinfectants in pharmaceutical environments. Okay, it's a it's a very well documented phenomena with, um, for example, antibiotics, um, but in terms of um, use of disinfectants in clean rooms, it's widely discredited. The real reason that we rotate is to make sure we have the full spectrum of activity. So in other words, we are using two different agents and the use of those two agents make sure that we can kill all of the bacteria, all of the fungi and um, all of the spores within our clean room. Okay, So that's the real reason we're rotating. Okay, um, And we do that um, that rotation to make sure that we don't have to continually use a sporicidal agent. Okay, So that's normally the recommendation, a bactericide, fungicide, so a product that has both those activities rotated with a sporicide. As I mentioned, there is no industry standard for rotation, um, but actually just using a sporicide as required um, is considered fairly reactive and not really recommended. So, so, you know, it's good to have it in there within your written schedule. And actually your environmental monitoring data should be used to justify the frequency. And broadly speaking, if your EM data is in control, then your frequency is probably appropriate. Good. So we'll move on then to sort of cleaning and disinfection. And I think this is really important. This is where we've seen some extra, you know, focus really. Um, you know, of, of recent changes to Annex 1 around cleaning and disinfection. And sometimes it's useful to consider those um, two uh, processes uh, separately, so cleaning and disinfection. So we can see in Annex 1, it's telling you for disinfection to be effective, prior cleaning to remove surface contamination should be performed, and your cleaning program should effectively remove disinfectant residues. The FDA guidance says, you know, a, a similar thing, you know, um, around uh, making sure that you're you're performing uh, cleaning um, and making sure you're validating. So the best practice really is to think about whether you need to do this cleaning and disinfection separately. Okay. Um, what we need to make sure as well is that we don't have interaction between different chemistries left on a surface as well. That can cause um, inhibition of the killing mechanism. In other words, two different disinfectants may interfere with each other and actually become less efficacious. Equally, they, they may become more efficacious, but you know there is a possibility there that you can have inhibition of their ability to kill. Okay. You can then have buildup of residues, um, which can be a, a health and safety issue, slippery floors, sticky floors. Um, uh, you know, so we need to avoid that. And obviously, again, um, regulators and auditors will be looking at that. And we can also have compatibility issues with different disinfectant products. We've seen this where we've had customers, for example, use um, sodium hypochlorite based disinfectants, and then they've left residues of that on a, on a surface, and then they've applied an, an acid base or an acidic disinfectant afterwards. And actually, that residue has released chlorine gas in the clean room, okay, so which is never a desirable outcome. Similarly, we've seen it where um, people have applied um, um, uh, phenolics uh, on top of um, hypochlorites and they formed a, a bright orange precipitate which is it dyed the floor and actually dyed the operator's shoes. So we need to make sure that you know we, we avoid those types of interactions. So then we move on to disinfectant validation. Okay, so what are the requirements and the expectations around validating disinfectants for clean rooms? So if we look at the FDA aseptic processing guide, it's telling you the suitability, efficacy, and limitations of the agents, the disinfected agents and procedures should be assessed. Okay, and then once they are established, once these procedures are established, we need to evaluate the adequacy through our EM program. Okay, so basically we're constantly monitoring to make sure the cleaning and disinfection are still adequate for us. 
in the PICS validation of aseptic processes, it's telling us that the effectiveness of disinfectants and the minimum contact times on surfaces should be validated. In the USP, it goes on to give you a kind of three-stage process that you might want to think about uh, when looking to demonstrate the efficacy of your disinfectant. And then when we look at the latest draft of Annex 1, okay, so that's version 12 again, it's telling you very clearly that the disinfection process should be validated. Validation studies should demonstrate uh, the suitability, suitability and effectiveness of disinfectants in the specific manner in which they are used. In other words, we need to try and make sure that our validation mimics as closely as possible what we're actually doing in practice. So when it comes to your validation then, it's likely you'll be doing some in vitro, some test tube laboratory studies, and also some in situ testing as well. So very commonly called um, phase three studies. And one of my colleagues, um, Helen Gates, uh, who will be joining me for the Q&A at the end of this session, um, has actually um, given some presentations and written some guidance around what we call these phase three studies, these um, in situ studies um, to help our, our sort of customers with this. Um, so that's the kind of way we really need to think about approaching validation, doing you know, some laboratory tests, but also seeing uh, how those, those disinfectants work in practice. We need to think about setting appropriate cri acceptance criteria for our laboratory testing. Uh, we need to be looking at testing the predominant or most difficult to kill organisms and the predominant or most common surfaces within our clean rooms okay, to, to make sure that we gather enough data to make sure we are happy that the disinfectants can maintain control. And then we mean, may need to do some revalidation, and that's usually a response to a new or predominant organism, a new clean room surface or material. So for example, if you put a new floor down in your clean room, it's a different material type. You may need to do some validation to show the disinfectants are still, are still effective on that material. Um, and certainly, if there is ever a change to the disinfectant formulation, you are going to need to do some revalidation. So this is, again, another really good reason to only use reputable suppliers of disinfectants. They will notify you if there is going to be a change to a formulation. Hopefully, they will not change formulations, but if they do, they will notify you and give you adequate time to perform some revalidation. So typically, in the region of three to six months notification. And just a little hint at the end there, really, um, you know, a good place actually to record this assessment of whether your um, validation is still up to date is actually in your annual environmental monitoring report. So really, that's where you can you can see the different um, organisms that have been uh, isolated, um, the numbers and types, um, and you can actually uh, consider whether your disinfectant is still fit for purpose. Now, we'll just mention very quickly that uh, Ecolab has actually developed a guidance system, a validation guidance system, to try and help customers with this, this process, really. So there's a validation portal um, that enables users to complete a, an online form through a secure login. So the secure login is gained through the Ecolab website. Okay, um, You can actually log on to that system, and this helps you guide you through this process of due diligence, really, about... Um, you know, making sure that you have data on the efficacy of, you know, of, of your disinfectants. Basically, you have suitable validation data. So what you'll actually do in that system um, is, first of all, of course, you will select Ecolab as your supplier because this is an Ecolab system. Um, you know, it's, it's worth looking out there to see if other companies have a similar system. But to our knowledge, Ecolab currently is the only one that has a guidance system. So you will select the manufacturer. You will then select the cleaners or disinfectants that you want to use, and you will enter the reasons for selection. So it's about documenting your thought processes. So you will do all of that good stuff. And what actually this will do is the system will then automatically populate in an appendix, for example, the um, uh, the uh, audit document, the sort of um, the vendor questionnaire, if you like, for Ecolab. Then it will also populate. So for for every um, disinfectant or detergent you've selected, it will populate um, efficacy data um, and, and some of the sort of health and safety data and certificates for each of those disinfectants into an appendix for you. So it's a way of building up a dossier, if you like. 
then if you decide you do have you know one or two strange organisms or materials that you do need to do some validation on um, it actually guides you through recording or documenting the thought process around why you're selecting those organisms or those materials okay and then actually if you get some external laboratory work done you can then upload that laboratory report uh, into the system as well so it allows you to do that and you can continue to revise this report until the point where you're happy it's complete and you can actually put it through a sign-off process internally within your company um, and, and actually produce um, a validation document just a quick note, if you are performing your own validation, please do ask for guidance from your disinfectant supplier. We normally recommend that you outsource that testing to an experienced contract laboratory. It can be quite complicated and it can be easy to get wrong. And again, really, from talking to both you know, the disinfectant supplier and the contract laboratory, you know, that should help you to use appropriate test parameters, so starting inoculum, conditions, contact times, etc. And it might be also useful to have a matrix approach to decide on the organisms and surfaces to test. We want to make sure we test um, enough surfaces and organisms that we have suitable levels of data, but obviously, um, you know, we don't want to test too much either. It's, it's, it's uh, expensive and time consuming to do this work. So this is a really good way um, of um, rationalizing the testing you do. And again, what can happen is, is if you're using that portal, it will give you, you can select all the reasons for those organisms and material selections, um, and you can upload uh, laboratory reports. In that system, once you've actually produced the report, it's downloaded, you can share that with auditors, and it will really give you, it will walk you through all of that test methodology, um, all of those assessments. Um, and as I said, it will, it will put into an appendix all of those really um, important um, technical documents um, that you may need to produce during audit just a quick comment here actually around um, environmental monitoring um, there was a change to uh, annex 15 in 2015 it did say that where you are testing surfaces in your clean rooms you should actually perform validation on the test methods to ensure that sanitizing agents do not influence on the recovery of microorganisms and really that's mainly talking about um, media neutralizers in contact plates it's to ensure that actually if you're using contact plates you have suitable neutralizers um, uh, in them um, to make sure that uh, if they do pick up any residues off the surface then you don't get false negatives so it's important to make sure you have actually validated that so with that in mind we'll ask what I think is our final poll question today has your site validated uh, neutralizers in the EM media you use against the specific organisms uh, on site. So has your site validated the neutralizers in the EM media against the specific um, uh, disinfectants used on your site? So if you think about your contact plates, okay, um, have you validated for the specific disinfectants? So the, the question is, the answers really are yes, you have validated for the specific disinfectants. Or no, they're not validated for the specific ones. So you may have neutralizers, but it's not validated for the specific ones you use. Or are you unsure? Okay, so we'll take a quick poll then. Good, so I can see everybody voting again. So again, thank you very much for doing that. It's really helpful. Okay, so I think we've mainly got the responses in. So again, thank you very much. I'll just close the poll. If we share the result, I think it's quite interesting for most of the people on the call. We can see here that we have 42% of you are saying, yes, it's fine. I validated my uh, neutralizers in my media against the specific disinfectants I use on site. But we have 34% of you said, actually, no, it's not validated for those specific disinfectants. And we have 24% of you on the call that are unsure. So again, what I would say um, is, Perhaps this is a really good opportunity to go and, and look on your site at whether um, you know either the the media um, provider, so the people that are providing your your EM media, or the disinfectant supplier may have some data um, that they that can help you, um, or maybe you're going to need to think about an additional study. And for those that are unsure, you know it's something really you perhaps might want to go away and ask the question following 
uh, today's call. So good. Thank you very much again for, for voting. I think it's really interesting just to, to take the pulse of what people are doing on their sites. So really when it comes to your EM, you know, make sure you look at your EM trends with your disinfectant efficacy validation in mind. Okay. So um, your EM review, as I said, should reference the original dis disinfect validation study and any additional work required. And if you have new organisms um, that appear, um, that may trigger additional validation studies. Okay. Um, but please, please, please do be aware as well that actually it is fairly uncommon that if you get a new organism, um, the rotation of your, your disinfectant, your broad spectrum disinfectant, your sporocyte, um, is not able to cope with it. Um, sometimes we see people jumping very quickly to introducing a new disinfectant. It's not always required. So, um, you know, please make sure that, you know, you're, you're looking at that cautiously. But as we said, from the poll, it's really good practice to make sure your contact plates contain neutralizers that are effective for the specific disinfectants in use. I'm mindful we're getting a little bit over on the time and um, we'd like to go into the Q&A session. Um, so we'll just cover very quickly transfer disinfection um, here, just to say that actually um, the requirements and expectations now um, are quite interesting around transfer disinfection. So transfer disinfection or material transfer, getting items into your clean room areas. And in the FDA aseptic processing guide, um, it's telling you that um, uh, you need to make sure you adequately control material as it transfers from lesser to higher grade clean room areas to avoid influx of contaminants and materials should be disinfected to appropriate procedures. And in the MHRA guidance, again, use a spray and wipe technique, including a sporocidal agent to inactivate bacterial uh, and fungal spores. Same really in PICS about sporocidal agents being used to spray in components and equipment. And Annex 1, again, telling you that make sure you've got items on an approved list, okay, um, and make sure that un any unimproved, unapproved items that require transfer um, are pre-approved and they're only done as an exception. So make sure really you think about where sporocytes are appropriate um, and making sure you have things on an approved list. So pass-through hatches should also be designed to protect the higher grade environment and the movement of material um, should be subject to cleaning and disinfection commensurate with the risk and in line with your CCS. So really important points there. So historically, we used to use alcohol because it evaporated quickly. It was fast acting and low residue. It's now an expectation to think about using sporocidal agents in the process. Make sure you think about where you are wrapping items or unwrapping items as well prior to their use. So in summary then, we mentioned cleaning and disinfection is a critical process, but it's often overlooked. The regulatory documents leave a lot unsaid, but there are lots of guidance documents. And the new draft annex one gives much more guidance, although it is still subject to change. And as we see, the, the requirements are largely harmonized between regulators. So that does enable us to sort of share knowledge and experience and best practice like we have done today. So, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Hi. Have we got any questions online at all? Hello? Okay, if I can ask uh, Uday or Helen if we've got any questions. Hi, my yeah, yeah. Helen. Ah, oh, there, yeah, I was going to say, questions. I couldn't hear yeah. Uday speaking. Yeah, okay. Ah. <laughs> no, I had muted myself. Uh, so, Helen, you, you would take the questions, you would read it out and do it? You're able to yeah, see the happy questions? Yeah, to host the questions, yep, yeah, with myself yeah. and Matt, that's fine, yep. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, hi everybody. <laughs> Just to introduce myself, I'm Helen Gates. I, I work with Matt uh, in the Global Technical Consultant team. Um, so we've got some great questions in uh, from, thank you very much for your contribution. So I'll just work my way through asking these. Um, so the first one is around the daily application of sporocidal agents is not generally favored because of their tendency to corrode equipment. 
Yep. And because of potential safety issues, could we please guide how someone would should fulfill um, the design of a disinfectant program and what's the minimum requirement? Yeah, sure. Um, great question. And it's, and it's something that comes up very often. And, and as you can see, um, <clears throat> um, what we very often find is that um, people are confused around this. And actually, when it comes to the regulation, the only sort of place where some kind of frequency is given um, is in that USP guidance. So what we generally say is <clears throat> try um, where you can to use sporicides as little as possible. So just as a, th a throwaway example, um, you might want to use your broad spectrum disinfectant on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and just have a single application of your sporicide on a Friday. Or similarly, try and use your broad spectrum disinfectant perhaps for two weeks and for a single point at the end of two weeks, um, you just use your sporicidal product. There isn't a requirement to have equal rotation. So one week of your broad spectrum and then one week of your sporocyte. That's not necessarily a requirement. However, it's really important that you are guided by your EM data and your and the risk to your product. Okay. So that's the critical thing here really is, is you need to do what is right for your site. Okay. But where, where you can, as I said, because of this possibility for adverse uh, material interactions, um, you know, it, uh, and chronic operator exposure, um, normally we try and reduce the amount of sporocyte we use. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think we've had a couple of questions asking what's the sort of minimum frequency of rotation or what's the ideal disinfectant rotation. And I think from what you're saying there is there isn't a, any uh, absolute defined rotation that needs to be put in place. It's really about your facility and your environmental monitoring data and what you need to control. Yeah, absolutely the case. Yeah, absolutely the case. Um, so yeah, it's you know uh, this is the key thing really, which is you you may actually, um, particularly if you're in a new facility as well, you may uh, want to start with um, uh, you know a rotation which which uses your sporocyte infrequently, and then actually depending on your environmental data, um, if you find you need more control over your spores, you can then increase the use of the sporocyte. Sometimes it's more difficult to go the other way around. If you have a new facility, and you start off using a, a sporocyte every week, okay, and then you think, oh, that's quite a lot. There's an awful lot of work to do then, and an awful lot of justification and data gathering uh, and studies to then push that out and reduce that to using it every two weeks or every month. So that's something you might want to consider as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, if we move on to some questions about cleaning, um, a question regarding, uh, is it good to clean surfaces with a surfactant, for example, tween, um, before application of another scheduled disinfectant? Mm -hmm. So we need to be really clear, and, and particularly with, with tween, I'm sure we've all spilt tween on the microbiology lab floor <laughs> in our time, uh, lovely and sticky. Um, so um, something we need to consider is, is whenever we're using a surfactant, um, we're actually going to be leaving residues of that surfactant behind on the, on the surface as well. So we use surfactants in order to help wet or emulsify um, products on a surface, particularly oily um, or sticky residues, for example, that helps to wet and emulsify them and helps us remove them. But we need to be mindful that actually, you know, that's a residue in itself. So we need to, to get rid of them. Um, so what we talk about with cleaning really is, is, um, is making sure that, for example, if you were to use a, um, a low residue uh, disinfectant. Okay, that's a low residue, not a zero residue, because I'm, to, my, to my mind, there's only a few which leave very, very, very little residue on the surface. If you use that over a week, you will be building up some slight residue, and then really we need a cleaning process um, to remove any residues of that product before we use our sporocyte, for example. And again, we need to think also about rinsing um, disinfectant agents to take them off of the surface but it's it's simply when we talk about cleaning it's this 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 idea of a, of a barrier basically if you have organisms on a surface and you have a, a residue or dirt or soil sat over the top of them then that can be very difficult for, for your disinfectant to come penetrate that that dirt and soil and reach the organisms underneath okay so we need, we're trying to remove that off and make sure that your disinfectant has the best efficacy it can 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and somebody specifically asking about the sequence of sanitization and whether the final stage should be the sanitizing agent or something should follow that, for example, water for injection cleaning. So that's, again, speaking to that sort of layering uh, of residues. Yep, absolutely, and 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 this is a, a again a really common thing, particularly with the with the, um, I guess the changes to Annex One and the real focus now on cleaning and the real focus on residues, which is people are, are sort of unsure what to do. So, um, you know, if you, you're using a disinfectant, and it's a it's a sort of traditional high residue disinfectant. Okay, um, really, we need to be thinking about removing the residues of that off. After. So, so the disinfectant kills the organisms on the surface, then you need to have a removal step. Now, commonly that will be alcohol or water, but we also understand that sometimes you don't want water to be the last thing on the surface, because again, that can um, by itself be a, a, um, a risk for microbial proliferation. So again, sometimes on small surfaces, we see people using alcohols because they, um, they're they very rapid drying, they flash off very quickly, um, they remove the residues, and of course, they leave the surface dry, and the last thing you've used on that surface is alcohol, a disinfectant. Okay. Sometimes the risk is less um, with your large surfaces. And again, you know, the, the, the cleaning and disinfection and the residue removal needs to be commensurate with the risk. Yes, absolutely, yeah. And someone specifically asked about the transfer disinfection process and uh, if you put a sporicide on your transfer, um, whatever you're transferring, uh, and follow that with the alcohol disinfectant as that last step. So, yeah, making sure that that doesn't leave, removes the residue and doesn't leave, but leaves a, a still using an antibacterial agent. Yeah, abs absolutely. And, and I think what we need to, to think about, and, and unfortunately we had to just for purposes of time, skip quite fast through the transfer disinfection element. Um, I think what the regulators are looking for now, again, and I'm going to use that term commensurate with the risk. So you, your processes should be in line with what the risk is. Um, so when it comes to use of sporicides, I think there's a recognition that when it comes to transfer disinfection or material transfer, however you, you term it, um, you are trying to take items from an ungraded, unclassified environment. So you take them from outside, from a lorry or a truck, okay, and you try and get those items into your clean room, okay. So at some point when they are in the outside environment, they will be, um, you know, subject potentially to, um, you know, fungal spore contamination, uh, spore contamination, uh, gross contamination, dirt or soil if they're in the back of an open truck. Okay. And you need to think about um, uh, removing that and going through this layering process. So it's about thinking about where your risk is. So is your risk between the warehouse and your grade D, because that's where things are potentially grossly contaminated. So do you use a sporicide there? And then you can actually use um, alcohol at subsequent transfer steps. Now, alternatively, we've seen other customers say, no, 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 my, high, my highest risk is between grade B and grade A, okay? And I really want to make sure that I have no risk there. So that's where I use my sporicide, okay? But again, we would say, well, that, that's fine. That's the end user's decision, but you need to make sure that you're not having the risk of um, carrying residues of your sporicide into your grade A, which is, which is not desirable. So there, your choice is either to use a sporicide that leaves very little residue, like hydrogen peroxide, or you, as you've mentioned, use a sporicide and then rinse residues with an alcohol afterwards. So it's all about the risk. It's all about thinking about the risk and at what stage. You know, you should have at each um, at each transfer of classification, at each at each uh, change of classification, as things move in your clean room, you should be performing a contamination control step um, and a decontamination step. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we've had, uh, on the theme of cleaning, we've had some questions that I think um, refer to equipment cleaning as opposed to the cleaning of the surfaces within a clean room regarding yep. um, what's the appropriate solvent for use uh, on an equipment surface, so for API solubility or the one that's used in the analytical method. And there's also a question about cleaning validation and the difference to cleaning verification. So I don't know whether it's worth sharing a few words about um, equipment cleaning and CIP as opposed to uh, clean room cleaning and disinfection. Yeah. yeah, okay. So 
what we've been discussing today is is very much talking about um, uh, cleaning of non-product contact surfaces. Okay, um, so that's typically your your walls, floors, ceilings, your small surfaces that are non-product contact. Okay. We, we sometimes within EPUB, we talk about product contact areas, and that can mean, um, for example, if you have a filling line, you have to make an intervention, and before you shut the doors back up on your filling line, you would like to do a decontamination step. We consider that a product contact area because we're getting very close to your critical point of fill. Okay, so we, we normally start to recommend very low residue products, um, very high grade products for use in those sort of areas. Um, with regard to cleaning of product contact equipment, again, it's a, a really different um, area. We have a specialist team that deal with that. Um, they can advise on um, uh, cleaning, uh, appropriate cleaning steps, uh, but obviously limits of detection um, on both the APIs that you're trying to get rid of, and then also, of course, you know the um, uh, the uh, NOALs, the non-observable um, effect limits um, of your detergents. So you need to make sure that any detergents you use, you're actually um, removing those detergents as well. Okay, so that's an entirely separate um, separate area. Um, if anyone is on the call today and would like to discuss. Um, uh, those kind of equipment cleaning um, aspects in more detail, please do go onto the Ecolab website. Um, we have a division that deals with that. It's within the life sciences division. They can advise very much on uh, on making sure you have effective cleaning to remove your uh, APIs and excipients, and then also making sure that you are able to uh, effectively remove uh, any of the cleaning or disinfection agents you use on that product contact equipment. That's great. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, so there's lots of questions about disinfectant validation. Um, so we'll get into those. Um, <clears throat> so a few questions around contact time. So um, that the efficacy test is determining is a predetermined contact time, for example, 10 minutes. Uh, and then questions on whether that contact time needs to be wet in practice. Um, is it acceptable? Uh, to have to use 10 minutes if you've got, uh, a, you know, validated recovery in five minutes, is that acceptable? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, right, we'll try and cover all of these. But, but again, um, we, we completely understand why there's confusion around this. So, um, and unfortunately, I've moved out of my office for a better better connection, a better internet connection. I've normally got a bottle of disinfectant next to me because... Uh, slightly strange like that um, but actually many of you if you pick up a clean room disinfection and you look on the side of the bottle you will see a number of, of uh, standard test method numbers on there and standard contact times that's actually um, that's actually testing that disinfectant manufacturers have to do to register their products so in order for us to say have a label claim okay or register them in in country um, we very often have to perform some standard tests using standard methods with standard contact times and standard organisms and standard materials and all of that good stuff. Okay, um, and that's set in stone and we can't change that. Okay, so that's where people start to get confused about this: five minutes, ten minutes, sixty minutes, fifteen minutes. Um, that's where those those contact times are coming from. From the expectation uh, of. Uh, regulators and actually to really we should put the regulators to one side actually your own expectation to make sure that you are confident in your cleaning and disinfection regime should be that you make sure that your disinfectants can kill the type of organisms you get in your facility on the type of materials you have in your facility in the contact time that you can achieve in your facility okay so what you really need to do is is turn it on its head slightly Go into your, your manufacturing plant, put some disinfectant down, and see how long it stays wet on the surface. So does it stay wet for um, 60 minutes? If it doesn't, then I would suggest any manufacturer that's telling you you need a 60-minute contact time, you know, that's, that's no good to you. The ex expectation is you validate the contact time you're going to use. So if you validate a 10-minute contact time, that's fine. You need to keep a wet surface for 10 minutes. If you validate a shorter five minute contact time or even for alcohol a 30 second contact time that's absolutely fine you have the data to show that the, the the disinfectant is effective it kills the types and numbers of organisms you want it to in that contact time that's what you've done you've got that data 
And you've probably guessed already from what I've just said about wet contact times. We've had lots of debate around this, uh, lots of debate within our team. Helen will know this, and think you've part of the debate as well. Um, really, the regulatory expectation is that it is a wet contact time. Really, that's the end point that you measure when you're doing validation testing. Um, it's very difficult to uh, justify or prove um, additional activity after drying. Okay, that's, that's quite a difficult study to um, to put together. So, so that's what you're validating in the lab. So that's what you really need to do in practice in your clean room. It's it's um, the contact time you can achieve, the wet contact time you can achieve. Hopefully that. That's yeah, good. absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, for myself, who's a very strong advocate for the uh, the performance of a field trial uh, in, in the facility, that is demonstrating that contact time in your facility is controlling your contamination. And um, we've had a question about um, uh, extrapolating the, the data from the validation of, of the surface size of the coupon to your larger surfaces. As, and that very much is the field trial, the, the, the final phase of your, your efficacy validation is, is making sure that in your facility uh, that you're demonstrating that, 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 that the disinfectant is effective at controlling. So the application of it, as you would do if you were just normally doing your, your cleaning and disinfectant regime, you're generating data at that point to show it's effective. So you don't necessarily do a calculation to extrapolate from a a two centimeter coupon to a um, five meter squared area you don't need to do that you can do the study to, to do that application yeah and if, and, if, and i was going to say helen just for anyone that's not familiar with a, a phase three we're talking about essentially um doing a, a whole load of additional testing before using a new disinfectant then using the disinfectant and then a whole load of expanded testing afterwards checking that it's equivalent or better product you're currently using correct anything to add to that no no it's good good summary that's good <laughs> um i think we're kind of coming to an end so i'll just uh, one last question about validation and i think it's quite important especially aligned with the annex one updates talking about um uh, validation of, of, of uh, and residues being in there not just the efficacy um so there's a very good question that says how do you evaluate evaluate residues okay so um, at the moment, some good news, <laughs> which is unlike the product contact equipment that we've already talked about, where you are doing this no observable effect limits and, and all of that good stuff, and you're actually having to do some analytical work and, and quantify residues for very good reason, of course, because it's product contact equipment. At the moment, what we're seeing in Annex 1 is really... Um, uh, aimed at making sure that you reduce visible residues on surfaces. And I think where this has come from is, is um, regulators and auditors, um, broadly speaking, of, are now fed up of going into facilities and seeing lots and lots of smeary windows, and smeary stainless steel, okay, which is a suggestion that you've not really got your cleaning and disinfection process under control because what you've left there on the surface is a potential um, particulate um, contaminant um, and chemical contaminant. So that's, that's chemistry that's stuck on your wall, okay? And it's gonna come off. Um, so they, they don't want to do it. I think they're fed up of saying the same thing time and time again. So they've, they've actually adjusted the annex. And I think the point really is to make sure that you manage visible residues. And actually, when you start to see those visible residues on surfaces, on reflective surfaces, like glass, stainless steel, that means you've probably got the same residues on your floors and your walls. You just may not be able to see it because actually it's made of a different material. It's a white material or it's a vinyl material and it's not as easy to see. So it's around um, having some residue control, some residue management, enough that you don't see visible residues. And that's what the regulator is looking for, that you have considered it and you have it in control. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Um, uh, with one minute to go, I don't think I'll ask any more questions. I'll hand back to you, Dave. <laughs> oh, I think you might be on mute, mute again. On mute, you don't. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation and very good question and answer session. And before we end, Matt, you can have your concluding remarks. And with that, we will uh, close this webinar.
Yeah, sure. I think for me, my concluding remarks would be um, for anybody that's thinking on, um, you know, uh, uh, buying disinfectants um, for their clean room and looking at validating disinfectants for clean rooms or looking for advice, the key really is to, to make sure you're using a reputable supplier. Okay, and a reputable supplier should be able to advise you on all of those things. They should be happy to help you. Um, you're not expected to be the experts. Please do make, make good use of these reputable clean room disinfectant suppliers. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Helen, for this webinar. And thank you, delegates, for joining today. Uh, next weekend, also, we have an interesting webinar on cleaning validation, again, by an expert from Ecolab. And this is cleaning validation, detergent chemistry analysis and analytical methods, and what regulators expect. So we expect you to join next week. Please do join. And with this, we are closing this webinar. Thank you all for joining today. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Helen. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye now.